Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I have some, but I would uh, open up for the discussion first if someone else has questions. Yes, Max. I can't hear you, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, better. Okay, okay. good. Uh, so my question is regarding the choice of language um, for those projects. So if you use an imperative language like C++, um, you will have a very hard time mapping this functional formalism onto your problem or onto your language, actually. Mm -hmm. Has anybody tried to use something like Haskell to do this? Are you aware of something like that? Because it would fit much more naturally together, in my opinion, at least. But it, it's, of course, it's, of course, harder to code uh, or like to optimize. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you whether this has been done or whether there are examples. There are probably examples out there, but I wouldn't know of them. Um, yeah, so in terms of, you know, C++ and uh, these kind of coding languages, um, they're going to make it a little bit harder, at least again, from our perspective, um, to include this kind of, of language uh, into the code, which is why languages like uh, Python and especially Julia, um, which came up more or less recently, um, allow for a much, much easier, more intuitive way to write down our theory language into, or in the same way as you've written it down, let's say on the blackboard, into your code. Um, so how you would do that um, in, in the more established coding languages, I wouldn't really know. Um, and if, if there are other, other coding languages that could do that, then that'd be really interesting. But um, I, couldn't, I couldn't name you an example right now. No, um, I'm not aware of, of any attempts that have, that have done that. Yeah, uh, how much of like functional programming features from like Julia or Python are actually used in the code or do you pass functions to other functions, create higher order functionals? Is that, uh, is that uh, in the current Python or Julia implementation and does it improve the understanding anyhow? So I think Sebastian can comment on that too. Um, so again, the, the student of Sebastian, Banya, right? started this project um, not really knowing anything about editing structure codes. And we introduced him to, to DFT++, for example, to this you know operator-like uh, pragma, how to do things. And there are some YouTube videos as well um, in order to do that. Um, and he then essentially sat down and uh, coded his own code basis, which is you know, about as, as simple as as you can possibly make it. And again, I guess Sebastian can comment on that a little better because he's more uh, familiar with that code. Um, but uh, overall, the the understanding, I think that Vanya has gained over his course of, of doing it by himself. And again, within a, a rather short amount of time is I think uh, much greater than um, someone who is just a, either just sitting in a lecture and trying to to understand, you know, what what DFT is and what it's all about, um, or just trying to sit in a um, in a coding class and you know trying to write some some more complex things down, uh, but then not really having the the connection to actually what what the theory tells me and what uh, I want to do or what a code should be doing and how codes work. So I think he gained. Um, a lot of, of more fundamental understanding than um, in in other ways of, of doing these kind of things. So just using plainly a DFT code, for example, um, I think you learned much more than than that. I want Can to you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, so I make a comment on this. So the currently the pipeline for Python is uh, object oriented way to program the stuff. So for instance, the Hamiltonian is, is a class and you has then class methods to update itself or something like that, where in Julia you more like use structs, uh, which then are given to other functions and updated by other functions. And you use there more like a polymorphism 
style of coding. So you, it's easier to use and implement in languages which either can quite well code in an object oriented way like Python or in, in Julia cases with polymorphism. Um, you can translate between these pragmas quite easily and uh, you even have not to think about things. Uh, as you simply, simply can write the, the cut out the functions from the class and make the these these functions available not as methods as functions and then give it the struct and it's quite easy to implement that. So I have no idea if someone tried Haskell, but I, I guess it's you will have a really hard time to do this stuff in Haskell in a full functional programming style. I can think about, but I guess it's really hard. I would think it's at least in the time we plan for the project, the student has to to code it. Um, you need to be a good student when if you can write it in, in a, another month in a fully functional well, I guess you, you have to have expertise in encoding and of itself beforehand. Otherwise, I think it's it's not really going to happen in, in the same time frame. Yeah, probably. Uh, well, yeah, that's. I was just interested if that has been tried out with. Uh, because yeah, I no. was thinking it's a more natural way of doing things uh, with those languages sometimes. Uh, yeah. Thank you for this great project. I fully agree with your point that we need to, that's, this needs to improve the teaching of DFT codes because people also sometimes just learn DFT by looking at the app init documentation like I did and <laughs> then run simulations without understanding what the uh, base work or like the code really does. This is really yeah. important. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for the comment. Are there any more questions? Nobody's asking right now, and I have a question. Sure. I was I was wondering, you were showing the example from from Vanya, yeah, um, and, and explained that it's uh, the the operators like call of um, of the STF. Uh, but I was wondering, that was more of an expectation value, right? Like we we cal calculate the energy as sort of an expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Mm, I mean, yes. But but so my question is more: Are there implementations, or um, is that also be part of the project to actually just calculate uh, operator on wave function, for example? I know that practically one is often more interested in the in um, the expectation value, you say the energy. But from a computational point of view, I would be interested if that would also be possible or um, desirable to just apply an operator on a vector and get an eigenvalue times vector sort of thing. I mean, in its essence, uh, that is, and again, Sebastian, I think is gonna correct me on that, but uh, <laughs> I think it's in essence, this is this is basically what is what is going on in, in for example, in Manya's code, oh, okay, uh, okay. and even in the in the um, JDFTX, so the, the one that implements the DFT plus um, plus pragmas, that is the exact concept that you just pointed out, right? You you define your operators, um, and then you define the objects they are supposed to act on, and then you combine them. And then they act in, in the same way as uh, an operator would act on, let's say, a wave function, for example. And then you would get out, uh, let's say, your, your expectation value or energy. In a simplified view, SCF cycles only iter iterative call of a Hamiltonian procedure. So in principle, you make n times you proceed through the SCF cycle um, operation of the Hamiltonian to the wave function from the previous step. So it's exactly done. Uh, in principle, you cannot see because it's called now the SCF cycle, but intrinsically <laughs> there's the Hamiltonian, which works on the wave function, uh, which is also uh, already implemented in the PVDFT uh, Julia code, where we actually have the struct, which is a Hamiltonian. And you can also, after the calculation is finished, work with the Hamiltonian object and everything with it, which is inside. So you have the wave function and things correspond to that in a more natural way uh, 
as to, as it is typically done in codes, you need to get options for post processing. You need to assign grids and and so on. But you can then do this stuff later on. So you have your representation of your wave function, and then can later decide on how to put it into a picture using a real space grid or whatsoever. You have the information and can do it in a post processing way and not in a pre phase way where you need to decide before you do the calculation what you want to get out. So the um, sort of the, the operator. Um, the operator call is done then in the S, in the SCF loop, uh, uh, right? So like repeatedly. Yeah. Iteratively. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, I think that was from, from my side, actually. Was, that was uh, the main question I had. Uh, other questions from the audience? Yeah, I, I have a question. Can, yeah, go for it. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yes. Uh, yeah, so first of all, it was a really great uh, initiative. Uh, but I was, I was kind of wondering, at, at some point, it looked like you said you wanted to do those kind of atoms and molecules, as well as kind of extended systems. Uh, and for me, one of the big difficulties was kind of transitioning from quantum chemistry phase, which usually uses, uh, you know, as you described, the CC, PV, PZ, et cetera, basis sets to the kind of plane wave forms. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, in fact, I guess there's a, even the easiest way is probably the kind of just the grid for, for an atom or something. Uh, just a numerical grid, but but it seems like it's it's really stepping up the difficulty, especially as if you do expect extended systems, you need kind of you know even these pseudo potentials and things like that. So is that are you kind of aiming in the long term to to do those sorts of things or so do I have a, you know, a direct translation between uh, local and extended basis sets? Is that what you? Yeah, I was just because I mean that would be really interesting if you could you know have so I guess that. That so is, all these things, yeah. yeah. So that's that's pretty much the 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 concept of having um, the code written down in exactly this way that you have these these operators acting on um, on given objects, which could be your wave function, for example. And then the way you you set up your wave function can be done in different ways. So if you want to do that with a, a local basis, then you just use um, the basis sets that I kind of sort of described, um, but you should in the end be able to do the exact same thing with um, a different basis, like plane waves. And then also apply the same concepts to extended systems and not just to atoms and molecules. So uh, in the long term, as you said, uh, yeah, that is that is certainly um, uh, something that we wanna, that we would like to achieve with that um, to be able to to very easily translate, okay, you know, now I have a carbon atom and now I have a diamond structure, um, but I'm able to use the same basic concepts and the same basic uh, code structures. I'm just changing um, the way I represent uh, certain parts of it. And then uh, I'm able to calculate either. Yeah, I mean, that would be great because as you say, often you read papers, let's say, and they describe a method the, the implementation of that method is very different in different kinds yes. of, of codes. But if you could just kind of look at that method and say, okay, I just code up that algorithm and then I I can apply it to both solids or to yeah. So it, it should be it should be some sort of plug and play, right? You say, okay, yeah. right now I'm, I'm going to use my plane wave basis and I have an extended system or something, and then. Uh, Everything else stays stays the same, and it should Great. then be the same the same logic if I want to calculate a molecule or or a solid. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, that would be a very nice feature. Cheers. I have a short question con concerning that. If you go from from basis set to to basis set, oh, okay. yeah, uh, hang on. Yeah, 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 I'm I'm switching my camera right now. There we go. Um, because we were talking about the basis set uh, uh, regarding Tim's question, um, aren't there some operators that, in the way they are practically calculated, 
are sort of dependent on the basis set, like whether you have to perform an integration in the case space or so. Yeah. And this, I mean, this is of course, of course, would then be sort of written in the back. The students themselves would not have to interact with that necessarily. But somebody, exactly. Sorry. Yeah. No, go for it. Go for it. Sorry. Yeah. But, but I mean, somebody has to has to write that, and in principle, also maybe maintain it. So, do you have an um, an idea, or how do you? propose to do that in a way that's still maintainable because that's usually in my experience the parts of the code that are then really hard to look into well the thing is if you follow the dft plus plus you have a well-defined set of operators um, which are defined for some purposes um, can you hear me uh, yeah okay and these are basis set dependent, as you nicely mentioned. Um, you need to write them for a blame wave basis or for a Gaussian basis set or find a difference method. Um, and, but they are well separated and uh, can be also optimized for, uh, or for, from a person who has a specific goal. If you want to go in the direction of solids or you want to implement K points and so on, and then you, may need to have operators which can also optimize with, with respect to speed to MPI, but you then optimize the, the operators and the overlay code still is the same. So you don't need to change the overlay code and also the equations are the same. Only the, the basis set dependent operator needs to be redefined or you need to import it from a, a different library you write yourself for the specific problem. But the rest of the code still is the same. This is what is the nice feature of DFT++. And um, we also have written or I have written prototypes in Octave, Julia and Python, which can translate between the languages quite easily and have the uh, same functionality. And this is in principle the basic idea. Um, we are now focusing on molecules because we are interested in molecules, but uh, you can also do the stuff already with the code bases, which is there while implementing K-points. It's also in the DFT++ pragmas already written down how to do the stuff with the code bases you we have now or have extended now. And finally, we have these some, these some, uh, some of these problems. Typically we work with uh, Gaussian type orbitals and SIG is typically implemented in these. And when you want to uh, shift to uh, plane waves, it's not easy to do because the, the lo uh, logic doesn't apply for blame waves in the same way it applies for a Gaussian type basis set. And you need to look at your energy terms, not only at the total energy. You need to know what is my Coulomb energy. You need to know what, what is my exchange energy. You need to know what is my kinetic energy on a term-by-term uh, -term basis, which is typically not possible in codes. But what we already have achieved in the, the next DFT code of, of Vanya is that we uh, can get the same energies out, also the terms between different basis sets, which is quite amazing comparing, uh, find a different basis set with um, plane, plane waves, which Vanya did, or which is in principle not possible with existing codes because they have all, some specifica uh, which make it really hard to point out what they are really doing. Uh, if you have GPOR or MWCAM or codes like uh, TDFD uh, and so on, um, in principle, you have you to know what, what happens inside the code. So it looks like a finite different code, but some terms evaluated in a different basis. Or you run the blame wave calculations and still the kinetic energy term is uh, evaluated in finite differences. So you have errors inside the codes which you cannot monitor. And our goal is to have a clear view on the code to, uh, to clearly know this is a finite different code. This comes from this routine, this happens there, and then you can compare energy term by energy term and get out the same values, which is really important for a SIG, as otherwise you end up in, in strange situations. And then your SIG energy blows up because some energy is counted in other energy term and has another error bar. So 
how, how to monitor or how to maintain the stuff is so simply decide what is your ma main goal. So typically as a developer or as a PhD student, you, you have a specific goal, but you need to achieve a calculated extended system or a 2D system or calculated some metal organic framework or, or so on. So you have a specific target what you need to solve. And then you need to decide for the, the operator you, you may need or the basis set you may need and then maintain this or develop this. And the rest of the code stays the same. So this is in principle the, the puzzle key idea. So you have a very stable overlay code and you only need to adjust minimal parts of the code to your specific problem. Okay, I don't know I if this answers your uh, question. Um, partially, I, 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 see, I see a point that the, the maintenance will be done by people who are specifically interested. I mean, I was just, um, my question was more directed towards whether there's a strategy to make sure it doesn't have to be, but I, I think that, that that could not be like the really, really specific parts of certain evaluations have to be done by people who are actively working on that. Um, yeah. But yeah. then you got to be got to make sure that you know it all uh, interfaces in the end and uh, works right. in the same way with um, the different kinds of, of calculation types you want to do. And we hope for a better documentation as when you can find the equations as written in papers or documented in presentations also directly in, in the code. It's maybe easier to maintain the code even if you have not written it by yourself. Mm -hmm which yeah. can be a pretty big problem at times. Yeah, yeah. I, I, can, I think we I can, can all think. agree on that. So. Yes, yes, I think we've all been there. <laughs> yes. Thinking as a developer, you write down a routine, then let it lay for a month and you don't know what you have done. So what I see currently in the, what, what Vanya writes or what I have written, it's, it's more easier to start up with old code you have written to develop it even further. So the time you need to get to the state you ha had time before is shortened down to a very tiny amount of time in contrast to things are written earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I see, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, other questions from the audience? Okay, then um, I would like to thank you again for a very nice talk. And um, yeah, uh, thank you and have a great day. <laughs>